A reading from the Franciscan Book of Saints, March 5th, St. John Joseph of the Cross, Confessor, First Order. The island of Ischia is the flower among the beautiful islands with which the Gulf of Naples is surrounded. In this earthly paradise, a saint was born on the Feast of the Assumption of Our Blessed Lady in the year 1654, who sacrificed himself to God in a life of rigorous penance and contempt of all earthly comforts. This was John Joseph of the Cross. Even as a boy, he practiced extraordinary virtue and self-denial. At the age of 16, he proved to be the first Italian to enter the reform movement of St. Peter of Alcantara, a convent of which had been established in Naples. In his novitiate, he exercised himself in humility and poverty according to the example of our Holy Father St. Francis, and strove to nourish the spirit of mortification and prayer in imitation of St. Peter of Alcantara. Ere long, he attained to so high a degree of perfection that even before he was ordained a priest, he was commissioned with the building of a new convent. Wherever there was hard work to perform during the construction, he was the first at hand to do it. He worked now as a hod carrier, now as a mason. The building itself was arranged according to the strictest poverty. Like St. Francis, John Joseph preferred not to become a priest, but obedience compelled him to receive holy orders. Because he gave evidence of great theological knowledge and experience in the ways of a spiritual life, he was entrusted with the direction of the novices, into whose youthful hearts he was able to inculcate so admirable a religious spirit that several of his novices became distinguished for their sanctity. Several times, Father Joseph was obliged to accept the office of guardian. When the convents in Italy were no longer dependent on the Spanish houses, but were formed into a separate province, he was appointed provincial in spite of all the objections he raised. Just as every good work meets with many obstacles in the beginning, so it happened to the new province. In the spirit of humility, Father Joseph had not put himself forward, but it was in this position that his humility had to contend with the severest tests. Nevertheless, he bore all with heroic patience and constancy, and thus drew down blessings and success on the holy work. When his term of office expired, he lived as a simple subject in the convent of Naples, where he devoted all his time to the care of souls and the practices of piety. His mortifications were exceptionally rigorous, so that no one may venture to imitate him without a special grace from God. He wore several iron crosses studded with sharp points on his shoulders, his back, and on his chest. Daily he scourged himself to blood. He went either entirely barefoot or wore sandals in which small nails stood out. During the last thirty years of his life, he abstained from drink of every sort in honour of the thirst of our Lord. But he was still more intent on interior mortification. In order to keep his soul recollected, he kept a strict guard over all his senses. He strove constantly to deny his own will in order to do only the will of his superiors and thus fulfil the will of God. He emphasized this point also when giving advice to those who came to him for guidance. An optician named Vincent Lainez was a penitent and a great admirer of our saint. He had a little son, five months old, who was very sick and near death. Full of grief, Lainez came to Father Joseph and begged him to obtain the recovery of his child by his prayers. But Vincent, said Father Joseph, God calls him to himself. No, no, said the distressed father, he must leave this child to me. Last year he took my daughter, that is enough, one for him and the other for me. Reluctantly, Father Joseph answered, You should submit to the will of God, but since you do not, very well, you will suffer the consequences. The child recovered, but it ceased growing. It attained its third year, but gave no signs of intelligence. The unhappy father, whom Father Joseph evaded during this time, could stand it no longer. He went to the cell of the father, cast himself contritely at his feet, and acknowledged his sin. After praying a while, the saint turned to him with sincere compassion and said, You deprived God of the honour and the child of the happiness which it should have enjoyed in heaven during all this time in praising God. So God punished you, but now he sees your sorrow, and the punishment is at an end. Return to your home. Arriving there, the father beheld his child in the throes of death. With a sweet smile, the first ever to be seen on his countenance, the boy turned his little head towards his father, and his innocent soul took its flight to heaven. As an old man, Father Joseph was severely troubled with ulcers on his legs, 
so that he could hardly make a step without the use of a cane. One day, when he was in the cathedral to venerate the blood of the holy martyr Januarius, which is miraculously liquefied each year when the vial containing the blood is placed near the head of the saint, Father Joseph's cane was lost in the crowd that pressed about him. He was obliged to support himself at the walls until he arrived at the church door. There he paused while he asked the saint to return his cane to him. A distinguished gentleman who had come to the church in his carriage asked Father Joseph what had happened. Raising his hand, Father Joseph said, My hobby horse has run away, but Saint Januarius will bring him back. At this moment, the people in the church began to cry aloud, A miracle, a miracle. Father Joseph's cane was seen passing through the air till it reached his hand. Later on, a cardinal asked the favour of possessing the object of so charming a miracle. He had it encased in a precious shrine. At the age of 80, Father Joseph died like an innocent and beautiful child, his final glance resting on a picture of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It was on March 5, 1734. His grave at Naples is a constant object of great veneration. Many miracles still occur there. Pope Pius VI beatified him, and Gregory XVI solemnly canonized him on Trinity Sunday in the year 1839. A Reflection on Exterior and Interior Mortification Consider how wise it was of St. John Joseph that from his youth he determined to foster the spirit of mortification and of prayer. He continued in this practice throughout his life. The spirit of prayer is the union of our heart with God in all its undertakings. All temporal affairs, says our Holy Father St. Francis, must be subservient to this spirit. Without it, it is impossible to please God. The spirit of prayer, however, cannot subsist without mortification. He who grants his body and his sensual desires all that they crave will find his soul retarded like a flame that is covered with ashes. Therefore, the wise man says, the corruptible body is a load upon the soul. Wisdom 9.15 But the mortification of the body gives the soul wings, as it were, with which to fly to God. Thus the angel said to Tobias, prayer is good with fasting. Tobit 12.8 Do you practice this necessary mortification? Consider that there are two kinds of mortification, exterior and interior. Both are necessary, for without exterior mortification the interior cannot hold out, and without interior mortification the exterior is of no value. Exterior mortification sets itself against comfort, effeminacy, the pleasures of the palate, and the like, not only so far as it prevents the body from indulging in what is forbidden and sinful, but even denies it what is permissible, punishing it for former transgressions and so preventing it from committing new sins. Thus St. Paul says, I chastise my body and keep it in subjection. 1 Corinthians 9.27 Corporal mortification, however, must be practised within bounds, and for the performance of extraordinary mortification, one should always ask the consent of one's confessor. Do you probably neglect mortifications entirely? You could easily practise them in small things, such as in eating and drinking, in dress, in your repose. Consider that interior or spiritual mortification is the more important of the two kinds. This consists in keeping our interior affections in hand, in repressing our impatience, conquering anger, breaking self-will, yielding our own opinion, in curbing our eyes in seeing, our ears in hearing, our tongue in speaking. This type of mortification is far more difficult than the exterior, and yet in another sense easier, since everybody can practice it. But everybody must keep on practicing it if he wishes to save his soul and arrive at heaven, for the Apostle says, If you live according to the flesh, you shall die. But if by the Spirit you mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. Romans 8.13 Prayer of the Church O God, who didst raise thy servant Saint John Joseph through the rugged way of poverty, humility, and patience to heavenly glory, grant we beseech thee that by mortifying our flesh we may follow the example of the saint and so partake of the eternal joys. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.